Welcome back. If you are just joining us, my name is Andrea bassing Matney, and I am the Community Outreach Programs and Support Specialist for Research Services at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. A few quick notes before we begin. We have allotted 10 minutes for questions and answers at the end of the talk. You may submit your question for a speaker via Twitter using hashtag GenFair2014 or on the chat on YouTube. For captioning, go to the Virtual Genealogy Fair website and click on the link for today. The lectures will be recorded and posted on the website by the end of November. Lecture number 11 is entitled, Wagons West, Land Records at the National Archives, and our speaker is Rick Martinez, joining us via the telephone. This presentation is an introductory level discussion of federal land records available at the National Archives. While some examples of records used will be from the National Archives at Denver, this type of land record can be found at other National Archives facilities. Tract books, township survey plats, and land entry case files will be the main types of records examined, as well as some online resources. Rick is an archive specialist at the National Archives at Denver, Colorado. I am now turning the microphone over to Rick. Thank you, Andrea. Am I being heard? I'm going to assume that's a yes. Uh, as promised, I am Rick Martinez with the National Archives at Denver. Welcome to this presentation on land records of the National Archives. As, as explained, this class tends to be tailored from the perspective of genealogists from the Denver area, but I do hope to make this helpful to all researchers. And if it wasn't already explained, I'll mention that I don't have control over these slides because I don't have access to uh, certain conferencing equipment. So. Uh, Andrea and Rebecca will, will uh, control them for me, and while they do that, I'll try and channel my inner DJ for you. And this is why you'll be hearing me say such clever things as, <clears throat> slide number four, please. And I have complete and utter blind faith that they're on the same page as I am. So looking, looking over the slide, uh, we have several objectives in this presentation as shown here. Uh, one thing you're going to hear me repeat quite often is that NARA will only hold federal records, and I'm sure you've probably heard this if you've watched some of the other presentations in this series. When you hear me say NARA, I'm referring to the National Archives and Records Administration. NARA's land records originate at the federal level, but land records can also be created on the state and county level. Those records are not, I repeat, not held by NARA. And this is true of anything else at NARA. We do not, for example, hold naturalizations done in state or county courts, only the federal ones. That's a bit of a uh, tip of the cap to uh, Zach, who preceded me here. So in order to fully explore land records, it may become necessary to contact the various state archives, historical societies, and the county clerk and recorder offices. Out of these objectives, the only item that might come off as kind of technical is when we talk about legal descriptions of land. I just think there are certain benefits to knowing how that works, and I hope to make a convincing case for that for you. Slide number five, please. So the first thing you'll need to determine is whether an ancestor obtained land through some type of homestead or by a private transfer. If the acquisition of land took place from one individual to another by one of these methods, such as cash sales, quit claims, mortgages, leases, and such, those transactions are all recorded on the county level. Also, if an ancestor inherited land from the estate of someone else, those records tend to be probate actions, which are also not held by NARA. And as the last part of this slide indicates, there might be federal court records regarding uh, disputes over uh, land claims, but those aren't really all that common, at least not in my neck of the woods. Um, but of course, you know, being done on the federal court level would mean that you actually could track down those cases with us. Now, uh, don't be discouraged by all of this. NARA does not have business. Uh, I, I swear to you, we, we actually do have land records. I just think it's really important to eliminate things first so that we can hopefully avoid confusion later on. Slide six, please. County and state, le uh, state level records have to be pursued separately. Uh, we, we actually do have this county courthouse book, which is uh, in our research room here in Denver. It still sees a small amount of use, but it's, uh, the information in it is becoming out of date. Uh, you can find a lot of information about those courts online. You can also find a listing of the various state archives here at the NARA website. Uh, keep in mind that the course handouts will include a page that lists the various websites we'll mention here. 
Uh, some counties are getting more of their records available online, but it will vary greatly from place to place. And because county records will usually record the initial homestead, they can be a good place to begin your search. Doing a title search at the county level should allow you to get all the way back to the original owner. Now that we've seen what NARA doesn't have, we can start to look at what NARA does have, which I'm sure you're all happy to hear. <laughs> Slide seven, please. Uh, the chain of ownership generally begins at the federal level where public lands are concerned. The only types of records NARA holds concern these original owners. All subsequent transfers of deed are, once again, held by state and county agencies. So if your great-grandfather was the original homesteader, then NARA should have a record of that action. If he was not the original homesteader but somehow acquired land, it would have been by some other type of sale. Also keep in mind that the heirs of the original homesteader are not considered the original owners. So if your great-grandfather Frank, for example, was the original homesteader of land that he eventually passed on to your grandfather, Frank Jr., there would not be a federal record for your grandfather unless he had filed a separate claim of his own. And actually, I, I, I do think there are cases like that, potentially. Slide number eight, please. So this is where NAR enters the picture for land records, purely on the federal level. Track books and survey plats are the two most useful types of records available here at NARA, as well as Washington, D.C., and in some of the other uh, NARA regional locations. Now, keep in mind that it, uh, in addition to Archives 1 in Washington, D.C., and Archives 2 in Maryland, NARA also has regional facilities in about a dozen other locations. Land entry case files are held in Washington, Washington D.C. mostly, uh, and those really should be your, your, your eventual goal for research into land records. We'll get into those in uh, quite a bit more depth later on. Patents are also available through the Bureau of Land Management, and we'll touch on those later. I put patents in blue text because they're not NARA records, but they're still interesting. Those are basically the deed of ownership on a land claim. Certain types of records, like correspondence and survey field notes, are usually not helpful to genealogy, but we do see professional surveyors get some use out of them. Uh, survey notes kind of read like a foreign language to the uninitiated, and I definitely fall in that category. But if you do understand that sort of thing, then we actually do have, have records of that nature as well. Slide 9, please. During this presentation, if you see this little surveyor guide there on the bottom right, that means you actually have a handout with information relevant to this topic. Hopefully you, you have access to the handout that, that lists several land acts and a second one that gives you information about the Homestead Act. Uh, generally, public lands could be claimed by individuals under any of these acts as long as they were 21 years of age or the head of a family and had at least declared their intention to naturalize if they were a non-citizen. Main examples we'll be focusing on will be homesteads, preemption claims, and bounty land warrants. What we learn about them usually applies to the other claim types as well. Sometimes you might hear me talk about homesteads in a generic way that encompasses all of these land claims, or all of these claim types, but usually I'll be referring to actual homestead claims. Now, the main points to bear in mind regarding homestead entries, after 1862, they were typically, typically for 160 acres at $1.25 per acre if the homesteader proved six months of residence on the land, or they were essentially free after five years of residence. Slide 10, please. You should have a handout of this slide also. Now, it's important to keep in mind that only 30 of the states were open to homesteading laws that we're concerned with. Other areas like Texas, Hawaii, the 13 colonies, and a few other states distributed their lands by other means. This is the difference between the public domain, which is in blue, and the private domain, which is in red. The public domain lands had the federal government involved in settling land claims, while the private domain was pretty much all done on the state and local level. Even though there are elections going on, this is not a political statement. These aren't red and blue states. Land in the 13 colonies had been parceled out well before the federal government even existed. Because of this, those records aren't really federal records as such, which of course means NARA won't have them. Some of these other states came to us as purchases from other countries and had already been giving land claims to their citizens. This is where the issue of private land claims mentioned on the previous slide comes up. Uh, those people were given the opportunity to, to confirm their claims with their new government, but things often went badly in those cases. So in many cases, you'll actually have to contact the local governments for these red areas. Slide 11, please. The 
lands under the public domain were administered by the General Land Office. Sometime around 1946, the GLO was combined with the Grazing Service to form what we now know as the Bureau of Land Management. So we'll see that the BLM and the GLO will both be a factor in land research. The process of opening public lands to settlement had several steps. Surveys were, were performed in order to settle boundaries of Indian reservations. Preemption claims of squatters would have to be settled because people might have already settled those lands before the government surveyed and opened them for sale. Those early settlers would have had to have bought the land for cash outright or leave the land. Then eventually announcements would be made which would open the lands for public sale. Then land offices would open and begin, begin recording all types of claims placed upon those lands. After a time when purchases would slow down, land offices might close or be combined with neighboring offices. On this slide, we see that numerous surveys were done under the public land survey system, so different parts of the public domain were opened for sale at different times of, uh, during history. By 12, please. These surveys form the foundation that the legal descriptions of lands are based upon. Since I'm here in Colorado, I tend to use it as an example, since I'm sort of biased that way. Most of Colorado, along with Nebraska, Kansas, and parts of Wyoming, and even a little bit of South Dakota, were surveyed under what's called the Sixth Principal, principal Meridian. Uh, the rectangular surveying system uses a north-south meridian, in this case running through the location the arrow points to, and an east-west baseline, which in this case happens to have been uh, created using the 40th parallel, which is also the Kansas-Nebraska border. Uh, you can see that the baseline carries through into Colorado and right up to Utah. Uh, this map also has some longitude lines in it, so that can be a little bit confusing. Uh, to use Utah as a different example, the Salt Lake Meridian and Baseline actually sit at the intersection of Temple Street and Main Street in Salt Lake City. So latitude and longitude could be used as, as, as the basis for uh, a Meridian and Baseline. Other times, local features, as in the case of Utah, might play into it. It's not really important to know why, just that it will make a difference in finding a particular land claim. Slide 13, please. Now things get a little bit, uh, a little bit complicated. Uh, imagine that the surveyors using this meridian and baseline drew out an, an imaginary checkerboard of lines across their surveyed areas. Those lands were spaced about six miles apart, so each square contains about 36 square miles. These squares are known as townships, which doesn't mean they actually each contained a town. Uh, this is what you're seeing on the left side of the screen. Now, using the directions relative to the baseline and meridian, you begin to get what forms the legal description of a piece of land. This example on the left is showing us township 2 south, range 3 west. It's the second square south of the baseline and, thir and the third square west of the meridian. And, of course, you can figure out any other township just by the number of squares north or south of the baseline and the number of squares east or west from the meridian. Moving to the middle of the slide, let's further divide these township squares into 36 sections, numbered 1 through 36. The numbering always follows the same serpentine pattern of zigzagging from top to bottom. These sections are about one square mile. So the, legal, the full legal description of a land claim is made up of four parts. The first three township, range, and section are really all you'll, you'll ever need to know, but we're still going to look at the fourth part later on. That's the really complicated part. Now, there are some things you need to keep in mind. Uh, the township will always be either north or south. The range will always be either east or west. So please don't contact me and ask me to look for information for a land claim at township 2, range 3. The directions really do matter. Was it 2 north or 2 south, 3 east or 3 west? Also keep in mind there were numerous surveys done across many parts of the country, all using the same system. So you definitely will come across identical legal descriptions in different parts of the country. That makes it important for you to know what state a claim is located in, or preferably which survey it was done under. Uh, Utah, for example, was surveyed mostly under the Salt Lake Meridian, but a very small part was done under what's called the Uinta Meridian. So we would probably find Township 2 South, Range 3 West, in two different locations within Utah. Slide 14, please. Now, before we, we uh, learn about the last part of the legal description, let's make a quick detour, which I hope will make this a little bit more clear. Uh, this is a map of Colorado that shows the townships in their checkerboard grid pattern. A couple of locations like Denver and Boulder are shown as well. 
Now, again, keep in mind that each of these squares is about six miles by six miles, and each square is further divided into 36 sections, which this map does not show. Now, the building I'm in is actually located at Township 1 North, Range 68 West, and I sort of had to guess that the section is maybe right around Section 34. Now, here's where things get really kind of weird. There's an east-west running road just to the, north, to, to the south of me, which by no coincidence is actually called Baseline Road. You can actually run an imaginary line going east on Baseline Road, and after a couple hundred miles, you actually find yourself straddling the Kansas-Nebraska border, assuming that the surveyors actually did their jobs uh, correctly, which I think they did. And of course, if you kept going, you'd eventually reach the spot where the Baseline and Meridian intersected. Uh, whenever you travel by air, there's a lot of places in, in, in the U.S. where you can see some of this one taking off or landing. You'll see it in rural areas where you might have open fields near the airport. And when you take off and look down, you can actually see dirt roads laid out in these little you know, square patterns. Uh, many times these dirt roads are actually dividing a township into sections. Slide 15, please. All right, and finally, the last part of the legal description consists of what are called aliquot parts. It's important to bear in mind that a single section within a township contains 640 acres. Out here in the West, after 1862, a, a, a typical homestead was for 160 acres, which is actually one-fourth of a section. So the legal description uses aliquots to basically distinguish between potentially four or more claims within a single section. When you look at the full legal description of a piece of land, you'll see the township, range, and section as, we, as we've discussed. But you'll also see what is really often a mess of things like SW one half or NE one quarter, sometimes all strung together. Those are the aliquots. Now, in a perfect world, every homesteader would have settled neatly into the northwest, northeast, southeast, or southwest quarter of a section. But as we'll see later on, it's not a perfect world. So aliquots allow you to, to determine exactly where the claim is located. Now, uh, as I mentioned before, this is not really a, a necessary thing to know, but it can be fun to see exactly where a claim was. Later on, we'll have an example using some records which break this down for you better. Slide 16, please. The hard part really is making some connection between your ancestor and a land claim. The easiest way would be if a patent or title was passed down in your family. Even if your family no longer owns the land, it can, can often still be worth researching. All land transactions, even the, the initial homestead, should be recorded at the county level. I don't have any experience with those records, so I can't really tell you too much about them. Uh, also, the Bureau of Land Management has a website we'll talk about later on. There you'll find patented land claims in a searchable database. When I say that a land claim was patented or perfected, it means that, it, that uh, someone obtained ownership of that land. Some federal track books are indexed, but not many of them. Here are two examples where some, indi some in indexing does exist. They can be found at several genealogy websites. Uh, you can also contact us here in Denver, and we are willing to look through the Denver index if you can't find it online somewhere. And I'm pretty sure the good people at our Kansas facility would do the same with their Kansas index. And finally, on this slide, this last part is my little joke. There is no such law firm. But you can hunt and peck through the track books if you can determine a rough area to look at. You just have to narrow things down to give yourself a fighting chance. If you have reason to believe that someone homesteaded, say, near Boulder, Colorado, then you can consult a map for the legal description of that area and start looking through the corresponding track books. I've actually seen some people have some success doing that, and I've even done a little bit of that once in a while, but it, uh, well, don't tell my boss I said that. Uh, slide 17, please. So now that you have all this background information, there are three main types of records held by NARA that should be of some interest to you. They are, again, track books, township survey plats, and land entry case files. NARA holds numerous other types of land records, but those are, these are really the most basic types. Uh, the sample we have here is a typical track book. This is from the Denver Land Office. Uh, track books were used by the local land office agent to record the initial claims upon public lands. The information contained in a track book isn't generally all that exciting in a genealogical sense. Really, the best way to think of track books is as a, as a means to an end. Uh, the information contained in them will, will actually allow you to order a copy of the land entry case file, which we'll get into later on. The land office is actually not indicated on this example, but it's also an important piece of information you'll want. 
All these pieces of information that I've labeled up here, like land office, date of sale, and so forth, they're all necessary for ordering that land case file. You also find the number of acres indicated, which can also apply in some cases. Uh, typically, the name of the purchaser will be the same as by whom patented. Uh, more often, though, I, I really tend to see various remarks entered under the by whom patented column instead of a name. And those remarks can often contain valuable clues regarding what happened to a land claim. Later on, when we talk about ordering land entry case files, I'll be sure to list this information for you again. Slide 18, please. Very pretty. This is an example of a township survey plat. It's a map, basically. You don't really need to ever look at them if you don't want to, but I do find that using them can sometimes help you make sense of what the tract books contain. Now, most plats will only show the land as the surveyor found it, and will only give you the various terrain features like waterways, elevations, trails and roads, and maybe the locations of structures. If you uh, follow the, uh, the arrow on the map, you'll actually see uh, Camp Weld there on the left side. Each plat tends to cover one township, which again is a six mile by six mile area. On this example here, we're actually only seeing about six sections out of the 36 on this plat. Uh, this example actually includes the positions of the various homestead claims within this townships, uh, township, but not all plats will do this. Shown here on the right side of the screen is some information I took from the track book that corresponds to this township. Uh, that track book contains numerous claims. I'm using this claim for George Austin. Get ready to hear his name quite a bit. That'll sort of be our uh, running example. Now, as far as I know, he's not a, fam a, a famous person, although apparently there, there actually was a, uh, the, uh, the first mayor of Lehigh, Utah, was named George O. Austin, I believe. I don't think it's the uh, same person, though. Now, Austin's claim is shown here outlined in blue. It sits within Township 4 South, Range 68 West, and mostly within Section 4, which is outlined in red. You'll notice that parts of the track book information correspond to what you see on the plat, such as the patent number, which is 115, and also uh, the Preemption Act of 1841, or PA 1841, is also notated. That's the land act this claim was initially made under. So the surveyors came through and already found Austin living there. He was basically a squatter. Now, the other reason I think that plats are interesting is that they allow you to get a, get a good visual grasp of where a particular person was. Knowing where an ancestor was helps to turn them from a name on a page into an actual person. And for that matter, knowing their location might also allow you to make better assumptions about that person, such as which court was located closest to this person. All right, so now is the moment. I'm going to hit you with the dreaded aliquots one more time. But this time it should actually make more sense. I'm crossing my fingers. Slide 19, please. Again, keep in mind, this blue outline is George Austin's claim. Outlined in red, you now see sections 3 and 4 of Township 4 South, Range 68 West. The aliquots serve to indicate exactly where the claim sits within these two sections. Now, the first part of this set of aliquots is really the trickiest part, which is why it's a really good example for our purposes. So SW one quarter, SW one quarter, three. That tells us that part of this claim is actually located in section three. Uh, the green arrows that I added show you that section three, like all other sections, has a northwest, northeast, southwest, and southeast quarter. Each of those quarter sections can all be further divided in the same way, such that we should see that part of Austin's claim sits in the southwest quarter of the southwest quarter of Section 3, that pink shaded area. Now, we found George Austin in our track book under Section 4, so we can assume that most of his claim is in that section. He might not actually show up in that book under Section 3. Sometimes the land office agent would only make one entry. Oh, and by the way, I have seen uh, cases where a claim actually rests within four different sections, sort of like standing on the side of the Four Corners Monument. It's rare, but it can happen. In those cases, I'm actually not too sure which section the entry gets recorded under. So, you know, you only have four places to look, so it's not really that bad. Slide 20, please. Here we have the next chunk of the aliquots, S1 half, SE1 quarter. So just mentally divide section four into quarters, and you should see that this is the southern half of the southeast quarter of section four. Slide 21, please. Then finally, the last part, which is in the northwest quarter of the southeast quarter of Section 4. I have to say once again that aliquots are 
not really needed to further your research. So, you know, why does this really matter to me or, more importantly, to you? Well, with some of the various online mapping tools available, you can really zero in on where a land claim is located. Slide 22, please. You can find various types of maps available online that can, be, that can depict townships and ranges as they appear in present times. Uh, for example, Google Earth has a feature called Earth Point you can register for, but you can also find other options like this one without having to resort to signing up for anything. And I'm not endorsing Google, by the way. Can't do that. Now, I found this particular map by searching for Denver Township Map or something like that. Uh, this map even gives you the positions of streets within this area, so really anything is possible where maps like this are concerned. If I really felt like it, I could actually visit the spot where this homestead originally sat. This is located near Interstate 25 in Denver. So, as promised, this was the most technical part of this presentation. Uh, a quick note to homeowners, if you check your title or deed, you actually might see a legal description similar to what we went over, but it will also include more aliquot pieces like division, subdivision, and lot number. Typical sub suburban homes like mine sit on a very small piece of land. Slide 23, please. Here we see that Archives 1 in Washington, D.C. has some track books which can be used. Now, if you were to force me to choose between track books and survey plats, track books would, win, would, would, would basically win as being more important. Uh, you'll see why later on. Uh, track books can be located in a variety of places at NARA as well as within the Bureau of Land Management. And though I've never actually seen them, I'd say that counties will actually have their own version of track books in order to record their land transactions uh, going back to the very earliest, uh, earliest times. Slide 24, please. The Bureau of Land Management Eastern States Office has retained track books for, the, for, for these states uh, listed here on this, uh, on this slide. Uh, NARA actually will not have track books from these states. Uh, the BLM can be uh, contacted for information within track books, and I'm pretty sure they're a great resource for answering a lot of land questions. Uh, they tend to be experts. Their knowledge of land records should be probably well beyond mine, but they might only know their own records and, and maybe not so much NARA records. Slide 25, please. Some of NARA's regional facilities also have track books within their holdings. Here's a rundown of what we have here in Denver. Uh, we're really not well-staffed enough to hunt and peck through them in the hopes of finding a reference to your ancestors, but we are willing to take a legal description that a researcher provides us and track down the information contained in the books. You'll notice that there is some overlap between here and what we saw a couple of slides back. For instance, Washington, D.C. also has Colorado track books. This is because the General Land Office headquarters in D.C. also had their own working copies of books regarding Colorado lands. So the land office agent in Colorado would notate his track books and send correspondence to Washington, D.C., where the headquarters people would then make notations in their books. Now, I suspect you'd probably see very similar information in both copies with maybe some minor differences. Uh, for instance, the D.C. version might indicate, that the, uh, indicate the date of a patent being sent out, while the, the Denver version might indicate when that patent was received at their office. By 26, please. You can expect to find some, uh, you can find land records at some of the other regional facilities within NARA. I don't really want to speak for any of the other regions, so I'd encourage you to contact them directly to learn what records they do have. If you go to this part of our website, archives.gov slash locations, you can obtain contact information for all the regions and also learn which states they hold records for. You'd want to do this in order to obtain information from the track books and maybe look into whether survey plats might also be available. I think photocopies of survey plats can usually be made, but you know, track books tend to be more of a problem. Bound volumes, they really don't photocopy very safely. Uh, however, a, a researcher using the records in person would actually be able to take photographs without a flash, which is what I did for the track book sample back on slide 17. Best way to contact NARA tends to be by email, but you'll also find phone numbers at this website. Uh, here in Denver, we, we actually are willing to work with you by phone. Or, if you'd like to do some of the legwork on your own and get a much better idea of what's available, go to this other URL at the bottom of your screen. Uh, this will take you to what's called the Guide to Federal Records of the National Archives. Specifically, this one will take you to the section on General Land Office and Bureau of Land Management Records. Both of these URLs will be in the handouts for this session. 
slide 27, please. Here's a quick peek of what the Guide to Federal Records gives you. It's a very down and dirty sort of a snapshot of records, uh, series titles, and date ranges. If you wanted more detail regarding what the, the uh, records actually consist of, I could steer you towards a different part of the NARA website, but that's really a topic for a totally different presentation. Now, at least here you can actually determine whether or not you're in the right tra on the right track as far as which region holds a set of records. You notice that in Denver notation lets you know that records are actually here in Denver, or it might say in Kansas in reference to records held at, at our Kansas facility. Now, if there, was, if there actually is no such notation, that would mean the listed records are in the Washington, D.C. facility. Slide 28, please. Not all land claims were, were, were successful. Uh, many claims were also canceled or relinquished. A uh, claimant might walk away from his claim for any number of reasons, or the GLO might cancel the claim if certain obligations weren't met by the homesteader, such as failure to build structures or simply not living on the land. Now, even in those cases when a claim was unsuccessful, a case file was created for however long a homesteader attempted to prove his claim. Being aware of the dates when a claim was started and ended might help you decide whether or not you'll want to get copies of that case file. Claims that ran for a very short term before ending probably won't build up as much useful documentation as a claim that ran the full five years, but there would still be some useful information within that file. Uh, this distinction between patented and unpatented claims becomes important for another reason, which we'll see in a moment when we take a look at a website run by the Bureau of Land Management. Slide 29, please. And as promised, this is the BLM's patent search website. Uh, the URL is also in your handout. The great thing about it is, is that it's a searchable database that allows you to search for information by using different criteria. You can search it by name or even by legal description if you need to. Also, in many cases, you can download a copy of the patent from it. Uh, the only downside to it really is that it will only list patented claims, but not the canceled and relinquished ones. So this is why using the track books can, can become very important. You might go to this website, and you might see that one ancestor patented a land claim, but for some reason you found no mention of his brother, even though you feel sure that he also homesteaded. Well, very often you'll find that family members homesteaded very close to each other, so maybe that brother attempted a homestead but failed, as in canceled or relinquished. His claim would only be recorded in a track book. Now, here's a bit of trivia that didn't quite make it into this presentation the way I would have liked. Uh, there's a small town in Colorado, which I don't remember the name of it, but... When I looked at the track book for the area it's in, I came across numerous claims put down by people with the same last name. And it turns out their name is the name of that town. If I ever stumble across it again, I promise you all I will make a note of it. Slide 30, please. This is what the BLM website looks like. You'll need to select a state from the drop-down menu, and then the easiest thing to do is to enter the name of a person you're interested in. There are other uh, available fields, but... All you really need to get started is the state and a name. I usually tend to avoid providing a middle name or initial. That way, if I'm looking for George O. Austin, the database will give me all George Austins, regardless of middle initial or name. So you enter your information, click on Search Patents, and slide 31, please. When you get results, it'll list them as you see here. Some of the information will be abstracted for you, but for the full result, you'll need to click on the links. If you get several possible results, you can often eliminate some of them by checking the date of the claim. If, for example, I know that George Austin, or, or the George Austin I'm, I'm after, died after, died, say, in uh, 1880, then this first result, which was patented in 1890, probably doesn't work for me. And this little page icon shows me that an image of the patent has been scanned and it is actually available online, uh, I believe, free of charge. Also note that I did get a result for George C. Austin. A lot of times it's really hard to know if a person used his middle name all the time or even his middle initial. So the next slide will show us what we'll see by clicking on the full result link. Slide 32, please. Here we have the full information for that result, and it contains all the information that I'll eventually need to order copies of, land, of the land entry case file. And on the right side, for comparison, here's the information I got from the track book. Now, there are some surprises here. When we were looking at the track book, only George Austin was named, but not this Pedro Mirabel person. 
you look closely at their names on the BLM search result, you'll see that Austin is notated with the letter P. That means he was the patentee or the person who received the patent. Mirabelle is notated with a W, which means that he was the warranty or the person whose warrant was used for the purchase. And his warrant number is indicated on the search result as well, uh, as well as in the track book as 102618. So now it appears that George Austin obtained this land by using a military bounty land warrant that he got from Pedro Mirabel. We'll talk more about bounty land warrants later on. It's also interesting that the track book indicates that Austin made his claim, made his initial claim under the Preemption Act of 1841, but the BLM website does not. Slide 33, please. A couple of slides ago, we saw that apparently there's a digital copy of this patent available. I think BLM is still in the process of digitizing some of their patents in their holdings, but many of them are uh, available now at this website. In cases where an image is not available, the site provides you with the, uh, with the contact information you need to order a copy. Slide 34, please. Still on the BLM website, here we see the image of the warrant for this land claim. Mirabelle apparently sold his bounty land warrant to George Austin, or maybe they were partners somehow. If we look back at the track book entry where we found Austin, it shows us that his claim was originally list listed as a Preemption Act claim, uh, PA 1841. Uh, Austin was basically a squatter on this land. He had to either pay cash for the land or leave it. So he may have found it cheaper to buy this warrant from Mirabelle and then redeem it for this land rather than pay the cash outright. Keep in mind that this is not the way most land claims came about. This example of Austin and Mirabelle shows you some of the more unusual things that could happen. More often, you'll find that the homestead claims tend to be very cut and dry. The homesteader usually put down a homestead claim, and if, it's, if successful, it ran the full five years. Uh, less often, you'll see a homestead claim become a cash purchase before running the full five years. Uh, those notations I mentioned in the track books can actually provide clues for that. Or if the homesteader was a squatter the way Austin was, then usually cash would be used to gain ownership of land rather than a warrant. I'll be referring to Austin and Mirabel later on, so try to keep in mind that Austin was the eventual landowner, while Mirabel was the military veteran whose warrant was used for the purchase. Slide 35, please. This is what patents will generally look like. They're usually a single page like this one and really only give you some basic who, where, and when uh, types of things for the land transaction. If you, if you can obtain a copy from it from the BLM website free of charge, it's a good deal. Bear in mind that the patent is a completely different document from the land entry case file. NARA does not hold the patents. In the past, I've actually heard the land entry case files referred to as patent files, but that's not exactly correct. Another thing to keep in mind is that, is that this uh, website can also provide you with images of township survey plats. Now, I'm not sure if those plats will be like copies, you know, such as we use with our homesteads marked on them, or if they're just, you know, the clean, unmarked copies. At any rate, this site is a very good resource despite not having the unpatented claims listed. Slide 36, please. This information is correct. You know, there, there actually are over 10 million case files held by NARA. I said before that if I had to choose between track books and township survey plats, I'd choose the track books as being more important. Well, this is the reason why. Uh, the information you gather from the track books or from the BLM website is what allows you to order copies of these land entry case files. Now, the case files generally consist of the, uh, of the various applications, forms, and correspondence that was created during the process of trying to patent the homestead claim. Uh, this type of record most likely will give you uh, really a large amount of genealogical information, at least most of the time. Slide 37, please. Some land acts were less strict than other acts, and so the quality and quantity of documentation within case files will vary quite a bit. In the very least, these records will allow you to link an ancestor to a particular time and location. By 38, please. But it doesn't really matter which type of claim was made on a piece of land. A case file would have been created for it. Usually the more recent records tend to have better information. By 39, please. Cash entries will generally have less information in them. Often it will simply amount to, you know, the who, what, when, where, and how much, how much money was used type of information. But, you know, sometimes in looking through track books, I've encountered a decent number of situations where someone started out by, by trying to prove a standard homestead only to later end up paying cash outright. 
Uh, it's very similar to the case of Austin starting his claim under the Preemption Act, only to wind up using a bounty land warrant later on. So the case file would still consist of whatever had been collected up to that point, so you can never be too sure what you'll find. As I mentioned, getting those picky little details from the track book can sometimes shed more light on the process that the homesteader was going through. Slide 40, please. Prior to about 1840, you might only find the bare essentials in a homestead case file. The name of the homesteader, the location, the acreage of the claim, the dates the claim ran, and the price. Later records might include information about the homesteader, such as age, place of birth, citizenship status, economic status, and literacy. Uh, sometimes you might even find similar information regarding family members. You may also find information about how the land was used and what distinctive features it may have. Now, none of this is guaranteed, but it still has the potential to take your research in other directions. Uh, the sample we see here comes from a case file of Charles P. Ingalls of Little House on the Prairie fame. Uh, you can find this online at the, NARA, at the NARA website if you want a better idea of what kinds of things can be found within a case file. Your list of links includes one that uh, will actually take you directly to this case file. Slide 41, please. Bounty land warrants have been around for a very long time. It's important to keep in mind that the bounty land warrant application file is something separate from either the Veterans Compiled Service file or the pension application file. It's also different from the land entry, uh, land entry case file. The bounty land application file will, will contain information very similar to what's seen in the pension files. Pension files have been known to contain things like birth, death, and marriage records, as well as more personal things like pages from family Bibles and family letters. Now, as we saw from our earlier example of George Austin and Pedro Mirabel, the actual warrant is basically a voucher which can be surrendered for public lands. Early on, each warrant was assigned a particular piece of land, then they went to a lottery system to determine which piece of land a person got, and then finally towards the end, uh, a warrant could be turned in for any piece of public land, which seems to have been the case uh, for, for George Austin. In the majority of cases, the veteran chose to transfer or sell his warrant to someone else because many veterans were already landowners and would therefore have little interest in moving west. Slide 42, please. So when you go about ordering copies of the land entry case file, the first thing you should determine is the rough category it belongs in. This will make a difference in terms of the information you'll need to submit. There's a split between pre- and post-1908. It came about because the General Land Office made a change to their system of assigning claim and patent numbers. Early on, it was done under each land office, so prior to 1908, you might see a claim number 500 in both the Denver Land Office and the Pueblo Land Office, as well as in, say, the Buffalo-Wyoming land office. After 1908, you'll just see a, a, a unique claim number within a given state, such as Colorado claim number 0500. Slide 43, please. All right, this form, the NATF, can be found on the NARA website. One of the links in your handouts will take you there. The pre-1908 case files require a pretty fair amount of information. Patented case files are easier because you can find those on the BLM website, and they break the information down very neatly for you. And if you use the track book, you can also double-check the information against the BLM website. That can be very helpful in cases where the track book is hard to read. Doing that can also help you make sense of any unusual information. The track book we looked at told us that Austin was a squatter, but the BLM website didn't. But the BLM website gave us the name of the person whose bounty land warrant Austin used, to make his purchase, but the track book didn't mention that. Unpatented files will uh, require that you find your information in the track books. Since they won't have a patent or certificate number, you should use the application number given in the track book. Uh, the Form 84 mentions entryman. This is the same as the homesteader. Slide 44, please. I'm going to call these post-1908 files, even though 1908 is actually included within them. As you can see, you actually don't need as much information to order them. There's one little tip I can give you regarding the patent numbers. For post-1908 files, they should have zero as their first digit. The pre-1908 files aren't like that. This goes back to what I mentioned before about how the numbering system changed in, the, in, in 1908. After 1908, you'll find a Colorado patent number 0500, so the zero lets you know which side of that divide you're on. Pre-1908, you'll have, as I mentioned, a patent number 500 from the Denver Land Office, as well as other land offices in Colorado. And, of course, this applies to all the other public land states, not just Colorado. Slide 45, please. And 
then the uh, request for the surrendered bounty land warrants requires the most information. We saw early on that the, that the uh, track books and the BLM website will provide the warrant number, the authorizing act, and the acreage. And the good news is that since a warrant was turned in and a patent was issued, it's all on the website. Uh, the Form 84 can be submitted online or you can mail it in. Please do not, do not mail the form to one of the regional facilities of NARA. Use the address on the form, which is for the Washington, D.C. location. Slide 46, please. I just want to make sure that a clear distinction is made here, again, using our example of Mirabelle in Austin. Mirabelle was a veteran who applied for a bounty land warrant. He didn't have to apply for it, but it was part of the benefits he was entitled to. After he got the warrant, he transferred it to George Austin. He didn't have to sell it. He could have used it himself, or he could have sat on it, and maybe it would never have been used. Austin ended up using that warrant to obtain the particular land claim we looked at. If Austin was my ancestor, I really wouldn't have any need to see the application file for Mirabelle. I'd want to see the land entry case file for Austin. For the same token, if Mirabelle was my ancestor, I'd want to see the bounty land warrant application, but not the land entry case file, which again would be pertinent to Austin. The most I'd find there might be something documenting the transfer of the warrant to Austin. Austin wasn't, wasn't a veteran, apparently, and he wouldn't have had a bounty land application file in his name. Now, in the most extreme case, Mirabelle could have used the warrant himself, in which case there would be a land entry case file, a bounty land warrant application file in his name. I would use the Form 84 for the land entry case file and the Form 85 for the bounty land application file. And of course, as a veteran, there would also be a compiled service record and a pension application file for him, but that's a topic for a whole different workshop once again. Slide 47, please. So the allegedly easy thing to remember is that all patented land entry case files are in Washington. But I bring this up because unpatented case files are going to complicate things a little bit. And here's a link that will put, you, will put the Form 84 within reach. Uh, you'll find a link to the form on this page, which is... Uh, which is in the handout. I didn't include the direct link because it's a really huge line of text. So just go to this site and you'll see a link that says Order Now NATF 84. You'll also find a lot of great information on land records at, uh, at, held at NARA here at this site. I, I did shamelessly steal a lot of information from there for this workshop. Slide 48, please. Unpatented land entry, land entry case files can provide you with practically everything that the patented files can although there are bound to be at least a few exceptions. Anything finalizing the claim, of course, probably wouldn't be present. But as mentioned before, at this point, the only way to locate the information needed to request them is by using the track books. Slide 49, please. This is why I said that unpatented case files get a bit more complicated. The easy part is that the pre-1908 unpatented files are all held in Washington along with all the patented files. Some, but not all, of the unpatented post-1908 case files are out here in the regions. If you learn that an ancestor had an unpatented claim, you should probably check with the NARA facility that covers that state. Here in Denver, we actually do have post-1908 unpatented case files for Colorado, Utah, Montana, Wyoming, and New Mexico. I'd say on average we have them from about 1908 through maybe 1925, roughly. There are a few similar situations in other regions. I think unpatented case files for Alaska were originally held in Anchorage. Uh, sadly, that, that, that facility closed recently, and the records were transferred to Seattle. And the Riverside, California facility, I believe, holds California unpatented files. So if the regions come up empty, then you should submit your, your NATF 84 to Washington, D.C. Uh, the regions, again, do not accept the Form 84. If you contact us and we find a record for you, uh, there actually will be a charge of $0.80 cents per page with a minimum fee of $20. Slide 50, please. Sometimes it's, it's really not possible to travel to Washington or, or one of the regional facilities of NARA. Uh, fortunately, there are some land records available on microfilm, and in some cases these microfilms have been digitized. I'll show you how to find out what's been digitized shortly. Uh, this pamphlet on land records has a lot of good information in it, in it as well. Uh, much of it deals with how to fill out your Form 84, but uh, you know some of my information also came out of it. Now, near the back of it, there actually is a listing of numerous microfilm series dealing with land records. Slide 51, please. 
the range of records listed in that pamphlet is really too great to detail here. In addition to the Act of 1855 applications mentioned here, there are also indexes to Revolutionary War and War of 1812 Bounty Land Warrant applications. They're just the indexes, not the actual case files, but those can be a good starting point nonetheless. Also, as mentioned, uh, some of these microfilms may have been digitized. Hmm. If only there was a way to find out which ones. Slide 52, please. I have to apologize for how cluttered this, uh, this particular slide is. Uh, this is a very good general purpose part of the NARA website because it will show you everything that has gone digital, not just land records. Uh, here we can see that this series, M804, has been reproduced at both the Ancestry and Fold3 websites. Now, if you were doing this research from a, from a computer in a NARA research room, you actually could click, uh, click on the series title, and you would actually be taken directly to that part of, the, uh, of Ancestry or Fold3 that has these records. NARA research room computers do provide free access to services like Ancestry and Fold3. Uh, this link is also in your handouts. Slide 53, please. If you go to the NARA website, archives.gov, you can find a way to research microfilm very easily. And you don't need to use a NARA computer. You can actually access this from pretty much anywhere. Just click on the Research Our Records tab, slide 54, please, and that will take you to here. This is a very good starting point for learning, learning more about NARA's holdings in general. There you can, you can also see a link to our friend, the Guide to Federal Records. If we click on the Microfilm Catalog link, that will take us to slide 55, please, this page. From here, you can search either by keywords or by the microfilm publication number, like M804. There are two really useful things you'll find when you get a valid hit from the site. You'll find out which NARA, NARA locations have that film, and usually a detailed listing of the roll contents. So this is a very useful thing if you saw a set of microfilm that wasn't available online. Uh, here in Denver, we actually have been known to do the occasional interlibrary loan of microfilm. Uh, things will vary by region, and I'm pretty sure that Washington, D.C. does not lend films. But by and large, we do prefer having researchers use the films on site. Slide 56, please. Okay, this is actually not a mistake. We're close to the end of my talk, and I have a little story about our, uh, our, our sample survey plot I'd like to share with you. I've been using this example for well over a year now, and about six months ago, I had a researcher come into our facility. He wanted to find out what we had by way of land records from Colorado. Apparently, he's a business owner in downtown Denver, and I guess once in a while he'd find various small artifacts lying around his grounds, things like buttons off of military uniforms and small things like that. Uh, he was already aware that his business is, is uh, located at the site where Camp Weld used to be, and he also had an interest in history and Civil War reenactments. So I was able to go back to my computer and email him a scanned copy of this plat, and he also spent some time researching in the matching track book to find out who the original homesteaders were in that area. That was probably the, the uh, easiest time I've ever had with a researcher. I knew exactly what to get him and where it was, and he must have thought I was a mind reader. And, you know, for that matter, his interest in these records wasn't even genealogical as far as I could tell. It was purely historical. Now, of course, I'm not promising that, that everyone is going to have that kind of luck when doing research with us, but I do want to say that here in NARA, we really do take seriously our role as the custodians of our nation's records. I'd say that most of us look at it as a responsibility and a privilege. NARA is not a museum where you're not allowed to touch anything. These are really your records. We just take care of them for you. So we're here to help you in any way we can. It's sincerely what we do. Slide 57, please. Okay, so we've scratched the surface on the land records available here at NARA. Be aware that there are quite a few finding aids available that can provide you with more detailed information about our records. Uh, speaking for Denver, we have inventories, inventories regarding our early general land office records, and in most cases we can email you a copy. And I'm sure the same holds true for other NARA facilities. Uh, thank you all for listening, and especially a big thank you to those of you who stayed awake during the uh, explanation of aliquots. Kudos if you did. Aliquot, aliquots is your new word for the day. Uh, you can reach me here at this email address after the presentation, but <clears throat> slide 58 will have a different address for questions. So I think uh, Rebecca and Andrea will open things up for questions now. Thank you, Rick, very much. We do have several questions that came in through YouTube. The first question is, um, how about land that was left to a wife in her husband's will in 1893 
Would the land be listed in her name? That's often a, a very sticky sort of question. If uh, Sometimes you'll, you'll actually see instances where, in the course of trying to perfect a homestead claim, the original homesteader may have died. Well, in, in cases like that, uh, my understanding is, is, is that the, the wife was given the opportunity to present uh, proof of you know, her, her uh, husband's passing and then actually continue to perfect the claim on her own. Now, if the case you're talking about actually involves a claim that was already patented and perfected and then, and then eventually passed on from the husband after he died to the wife, I'd say more than likely that would be on the probate court level. Thank you very much, Rick. The next question deals with uh, when to start looking at land records. There's a question about the start date. So let's start with a short story. They say, my grandpa filled in at the end of harvest season, built a shack, and returned to Minnesota for winter. In the spring, he came back to claim the farm and live with family who arrived later. What date should I start looking at for these land records? Wow. Um, you know, it's a lot of times looking in terms of a specific date might not be practical. Um, that would probably be a case, again, you know, where I might steer you towards the uh, county clerk or recorder for that particular area to, you know, hopefully track, you know, backwards in time to the point where your grandfather or, you know, whoever actually shows up. Um, again, if, if, if this is a case where uh, your ancestor obtained the land from a private party, that would not be a NARA record. And so, you know, re really the county level would be the only place you'd find that. Thank you, Rick. Um, if this, this is Diane Dimkoff, and I am the Research Customer Support Coordinator for, for Research Services, and I'd like to um, thank Rick for his excellent presentation. If he did not get your question answered today, please send it to us at inquire at nara.gov. And this is our final lecture for today. Thank you all for participating. It's been so much fun watching your comments on Facebook and Twitter, and we want to tell you how much we appreciate you hanging in there with us all day today, all day yesterday. And I do want to say that we'll be back tomorrow morning, um, Thursday morning at 10 o'clock with six more presentations for the day. So thank you. We're going off air now, and we'll resume again at 10 tomorrow morning. Thank you.